Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Woo You event. Tonight, we are joined with Dr. Corey Lappin, and he is his title for his presentation today is Contact Lenses and Dry Eye, the Impact of Soft Lens Wear on Ocular Surface Homeostasis. So I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Ariel Sorenzi. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Corey Lappin. He received his doctorate of optometry from the Ohio State University College of Optometry, where he also earned his Master of Science degree in vision science and served as class president, overachiever. <laughs> he continued his training by doing a residency in ocular disease at Cincinnati Eye Institute in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he now practices at Phoenix Eye Care in the Dry Eye Center of Arizona in Phoenix, Arizona, which is probably like one of the largest dry eye practices in all of the US, I would have to guess, right? Yep, yep. And uh, so he obviously treats a wide variety of ocular diseases and um, particular interest in dry eye and ocular surface disease. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a member of the AOA, and serves on the board of directors for the Arizona Optometric Association, and is also a member of the editorial board for the online eye care publication, Eyes on Eye Care. I read your articles a lot. Um, so Dr. Lappin received the American Academy of Optometry Foundation Practice Excellent Award and was named 2023 Young Optometrist of the Year by the Arizona Optometric Association. Here are his financial disclosures all of which have been mitigated, and I will have you take it from here. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Serenzi. So I'm really excited about this lecture because it's applicable to so many of us. So yeah, obviously I'm working in the really big dry eye practice, but you don't have to be in this gigantic tertiary referral center to be affected by dry eye. I often joke that everyone can run, but you can't hide from dry eye no matter what modality of practice you're in. And for the vast majority of us who are doing refractive care, you're going to run into dry eye becoming a huge issue with your contact lens wear specifically. And the reason for that is its impact on homeostasis. And homeostasis is something I, I almost, it's almost like a compulsion for me at this point. I always discuss this whenever I'm giving a lecture on dry eye or, or, or ocular surface disease, because to really understand how to manage our contact lens patients, our dry eye patients, everything comes back down to our fundamental understanding of homeostasis. So I always like to also begin with a definition of what homeostasis is. And the exact definition is a self-regulating process by which biological systems maintain stability while adjusting to changing external conditions. Basically what this means is that our bodies are made to adapt to any of the external environments we had to maintain this basically balance that we have for each biological system. And the way that this works is through a process called dynamic equilibrium. So for our biological systems, we need to stay in a set range. It's not that we need to stay at one particular value. We need to stay within a range. And if we're in this range, then our body systems will be able to function appropriately. But if we go out of the range by too much of a margin or for too long, that's where we lose this balance. That's why I always like to use this scale here between the biological system and our environmental challenges. I also love to always give examples. So the best examples I can mention for this, it's body temperature. So if we go, we like to be at about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we go to a really cold environment, we start to shiver. And that shivering is intended for us to generate body heat and bring our body temperature back up. Whereas if it's really, really hot, we begin to sweat because that's how we get evaporative cooling and that brings our body temperature down. But what happens if we get too cold? Then we can get hypothermia. Or if we get too hot, that's where we can start to get heat stroke. So that's the whole idea that if we lose this ability to maintain homeostasis, that's ultimately what's going to lead to disease and even in extreme cases, death. And the other thing about the system that's so cool is that it's feedback dependent control, but it's also self-regulated. So the best way to think about this again, through an example is one we're all very familiar with, which is reflex blinking. So if we get something in our eyes, the corneal nerves are going to sense that, they're going to send a signal back to the brain, and then that's going to send a signal to our eyes, so once the lacrimal gland to start tearing to flush away any foreign body, but also the obicularis muscle to close our eyes and to blink to try to get it out and protect the eyes. And we don't have to think about any of that. When something gets in our eyes, we don't intrinsically think, oh, something's in my eyes, I need to blink. We do it instinctively. And this is all processing within milliseconds, which is an incredible thing. So it kind of shows you how, even though we have all these complex systems, we don't even have to think about them. 
And then why does this matter in a contact lens a dry eye lecture? Why are we talking so much about homeostasis? And that's because the definition of dry eye, I always love to point out the, the fact that one of the main tenets of dry eye is a loss of homeostasis. So if we're looking at dry eye in any capacity, and today's lecture is going to be within the context of soft contact lens wear, we need to understand how that's going to impact ocular surface homeostasis. Now, just to kind of give you an idea of how this lecture is structured, the first thing is that this is going to be focusing only on soft contact lens wear. So I'm not gonna be talking about RGPs or scleral lenses. I always joke if it doesn't flex my hands, there's someone else who's a lot better to be able to do this. Dr. Terenzi would be way more capable of giving you that scleral lens lecture. So today I'm mainly gonna focus on soft contact lenses. And the other thing you're going to see with this too is we're gonna look at this balance between soft contact lenses and the ocular surface. So contact lenses to me are amazing. It's incredible what we're able to accomplish with this. I remember getting my first pair of contact lenses when I was 12 and just amazed at how well I could see. And so these are incredible medical devices and they give us really great benefits. I mean, we have the obvious one, which is the refractive benefit of vision correction. It can be used therapeutically when you're using a bandage lens. And now we're even using them interventionally for myopia management, but they also present a unique homeostatic challenge. And the reason for this is because when we're putting a contact lens on the ocular surface, we're introducing a, a foreign body onto our eye. So this is intrinsically going to disrupt homeostasis. You're going to have a disruption of your tear film. And it's even thought that contact lenses are likely intrinsically inflammatory. And that's not even going into the complications we see where you have an increased risk of infection and inflammatory conditions as well. Now, another big thing that we all know is contact lens dropout is one of the major challenges to our practice. So there's 140 million contact lens wearers worldwide, but this stat always blows my mind is that 51, so over half of contact lens wearers will ultimately end up dropping out of lens wear. So it's basically a coin flip if a patient's going to be successful in contact lens wear. And even then, just 20% of them are gonna drop out within the first year. So a fifth of our contact lens patients don't even make it past that first 365 days. So then this begs the question, why, why is this happening? Why are we only getting half of our lens, contact lens patients successful with lens wear? And what are the things that we can do to prevent this dropout? So as we go into the next portion of the lecture, basically the way that I have this structured is we're going to look at the ocular surface and how contact lens wear affects the surface and then also how ocular surface conditions affect contact lens wear. So you're gonna kind of see it from both perspectives. Other things I can tell you, this topic, it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray. If you look in the literature, there's some conflicting reports and there's not consensus on a lot of these things. And some of these things I'm gonna talk about are a bit more historical from older lens materials. But the one thing I would want you to take away from this is despite all this kind of differing information, there are definitely general trends that have emerged. And that's what I really wanna focus on in today's lecture. So now we're gonna start off by just taking a deep dive into contact lens wear and the ocular surface. So the big thing, first of all, we're gonna look at is the lids and the lashes themselves. Whenever I evaluate the ocular surface, I like to start and look at each component. So basically you have all the different elements here. You have the cornea, the conjunctiva, lids, lashes, the oil glands, the accessory lacrimal glands, the main lacrimal gland, the goblet cells, the tear film. I like to investigate each one of these when I'm treating a dry patient. And I also like to think about how each of these can be affected by contact lens wear. So the lids and lashes, primary functions are for protection and also to spread the tears. So what happens when we put a contact, a soft contact lens onto the ocular surface? The first thing is that there's an increased blink rate. Now, I always like to emphasize blink rate because a lot of people think, oh man, if you're blinking a lot more, that's going to cause dry eye. So it's actually been shown that increased blinking does not cause dry eye, but it can be a sign that there's irritation. It's thought that this increased blink rate is actually due to the fact that the contact lens is a foreign body on the surface, so our eyes are intrinsically blinking for this. Now, partial blinks, on the other hand, are associated with dry eye. So that's just something to keep in mind, but that's one thing we see is an increased blink rate with wearing contact lenses. The other thing is an increased incidence of ptosis. And this is thought to be just due to repeated mechanical, basically manipulation of the uh, lids, taking the lenses in and out. And then how can ocular surface these of the lids and lashes affect contact lens wear? Well, the big ones to look at here are blepharitis, specifically Demodex blepharitis. So when they looked at contact lens wearers who were reporting contact lens discomfort, 
93% of these patients with contact lens discomfort actually had demodex blepharitis. So this is a major thing to be on the lookout for when you're looking in your contact lens wearers. So if you see in the picture here, if you can see those kind of sleeve-like collarettes on the lash base, those are pathognomonic for demodex blepharitis. So something you would definitely want to address if you're having a patient struggling with contact lens wear. And then there's also bacterial blepharitis, which you can see when you have the kind of bubbly, foamy appearance you see here in this picture. That's associated with bacterial blepharitis, which can disrupt the tear film. And again, make it harder for your patients to wear soft lenses effectively. And then when we look at the tear film itself, it has a lot of different functions. One is protection, also nourishment. The cornea is avascular by necessity per, to provide optical clarity. So a lot of the nutrition it gets is through the tear film, specifically it's oxygen. And it also wants to create this smooth optical surface. So two thirds of the refracting power of the eye comes from the air tear interface. So this is a huge thing that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about contact lens wear. And contact lens wear, this is the big one. If you want to think of one way that contact lens wear is going to affect the ocular surface is what it does to the tear film. And essentially what it does is when you put that lens on the surface of the eye, it's going to split your tear film into two. So the pre-lens tear film and the post-tear film. So at this point, it's fundamentally destabilized because now you have the smaller volume of tear film on both sides. So you're gonna have less lipid layer thickness, less overall tear volume. You're gonna get more tear film turnover and a reduced um, tear breakup time, but you're also going to get increased evaporation and increased osmolarity. So all the things we classically associate with dry eye and an unstable tear film will be exacerbated by soft contact lens wear. And then if we have this poor quality tear film, it's going to lead to decreased comfort for our contact lens wearers. They're not gonna be able to wear the lenses as long because you don't have that nice protective ocular surface. Also, we all have seen this before. Visual function is going, to be, visual quality is going to be basically impacted. You can get that fluctuating vision where the patient says they have to blink all the time to clear up their vision. And also you can even get lens dehydration and tightening on the surface of the eyes. So if you ever have a patient say they feel like they have to peel the lens off, this can be due to a poor tear film. And then if we look at the mybum and the mybomian glands specifically, this is another very interesting area. So we know that that lipid layer is kind of the key anti-evaporative layer that's going to keep the tears onto the surface of the eye, make that nice smooth refractive surface and also lower surface tension, which allows basically for more easy, uh, this tears to more easily spread over the ocular surface. Okay, so let's see what happens when we put contact lenses on the eye. How is that mybum layer and the mybomian glands affected? This one was very interesting as I looked more and more into this. So this is incredibly controversial. However, one point of consensus is when you wear soft contact lenses, you will have an alteration to mybum quality. What's going to happen is you're going to get an increase in melting point by about three degrees. So if we have an increase in melting point, that means the mybum is going to be more toothpaste-like instead of that olive oil consistency. So you're going to get those clogged up glands. It's not going to spread as easily as well. So now you're basically moving into that evaporative dry eye that we often think about. So that's something that we have seen consistently that's agreed upon. However, contact lens wearer's exact impact on the mybelomium gland structure is much more controversial. Some studies have found that there is a significant effect and loss of mybelomium glands with contact lens wear, where other studies have found no association between contact lens wear and mybelomium gland dropout at all. However, if there is mybomian gland changes, this is what's basically been presented, is that it's going to worsen with contact lens wear. Most mybomian gland dropout, if it occurs, will occur after one year of wear, and then it tends to taper off and stop after about two to three years of wear. And typically the upper lids are more affected than the lowers. And when you do get gland loss, it's going to occur at the distal end before the terminal end. Now, the reasons that have been suggested for this is they think it might be due to chronic micro trauma from the lens being on the surface. Again, remember it's a foreign body and they think that that chronic inflammation can actually potentially damage the mybomian glands. They also think it might lead to a sloughing of cells of epithelial cells which physically block and obstruct the mybomian glands. So those are just different mechanisms that have been suggested. Again, we're not entirely sure, but it's good to keep in mind that there can be potentially an impact on the mybomian glands from soft contact lens wear. And again, when you have mybomian gland dysfunction, it's going to lead to that tear film instability that I discussed earlier. And then we're looking at the lacrimal glands and the aqueous layer. So this is the layer that's primarily going to lubricate and cushion the eye, and it's gonna provide that nourishment and the protection for the ocular surface. Again, like I said, you put the lens on the eye, it's going to split it into two. 
However, this is a pl place where I can talk about a benefit of soft contact lenses. So you can actually use a soft contact lens to stabilize the ocular surface. And I can tell you, this is probably one of the most underutilized treatments for really bad ocular surface disease, especially if you have a cornea that's just tore up from SPK. So when you put a soft lens on the surface of the eye, you're basically making this protective artificial barrier environment, and it's going to help facilitate healing. There's actually even one study that found that the use of soft bandage contact lenses was similar in efficacy to using autologous serum tears. So I've had one patient who she has terrible um, RA, she has terrible uh, rheumatoid arthritis and really bad Sjogren's associated with that. And, con and she basically, her soft contact lens wear is the most effective treatment for her to keep that surface stabilized. And then we're looking at the conjunctiva and the goblet cells. So the conjunctiva is really responsible for the immune function of the ocular surface. And then the goblet cells, which are located in the fornices, they produce the mucin layer, which basically holds the, it's the anchor of the tear film. It holds it onto the ocular surface itself. So what happens when we put a lens on the eye? So we often don't think about the conjunctiva when we put a soft lens on because there's not much overlap with this. So I often talk specifically about not just the conjunctiva, but that limbal region as well, which is so important here. And the other thing I always like to emphasize about hyperemia and redness is it's not a minor detail. Some people are like, oh yeah, my eyes get red when I wear my contact lenses. And to me, that means this is a warning sign. If our eyes are red, that means something is going on. Especially if you have this redness in the circumlimbal area or you get staining in that circumlimbal area, you really need to be concerned about the contact lens fit or the lens interaction. And that's because what's in that limbal region, the limbal stem cells. And I'll talk about some of the big repercussions that we can get later on if we have a poor fitting lens and how it can damage those limbal stem cells. So if you see redness and it's perilimbal, you should really be thinking about reevaluating the fit of the contact lens. The other thing that could potentially happen with contact lens wear is you can get reduced goblet cell density, which ultimately will lead to decreased mucin production. So that will also lead to tear film instability. The other interesting thing that you can get in the conjunctiva, which uh, often I don't think this is talked about a whole lot, is something called lid parallel conjunctival folds. And these are incredibly small folds in the conjunctiva. They're about one tenth of a millimeter. So you're not gonna see them unless you really mag up, but they're actually due to friction. So what happens is if the eye is really dry and the lens kind of goes down onto the um, conjunctiva, it's going to catch and make these little folds. Now this is different than conjunctival cholesis because conjunctival cholesis is much larger and it's going to stay. So if you see these parallel folds and you actually lift the lid up off of the surface, the folds go away, conjunctival cholesis will stay. So that's just, if you do see these parallel folds, that can be a sign that there's friction between the surface of the eye and the, and the lids. And this next one, we're all very familiar with this. I guarantee we've all seen it, and that's GPC. So giant papillary conjunctivitis, it's basically going to be typified by these large uh, papillae, which you see here, typically about one millimeter in size. And again, this is a friction-related complication. You get this chronic rubbing, and basically when I see this for a patient, I describe it, it's almost like getting calluses on the underside of the eyelids. And this is especially worse if you have a lens that's going to collect deposits on the surface because that can also elicit an inflammatory response. Now, this is the thing that's incredible to me, but the more I think about it, I think it makes sense, is that almost one in 10 hydrogel wearers will eventually develop GPC. And there's a lesser likelihood of developing it with daily disposable lenses. So anytime I have a patient who develops GPC, I always move them into a sci-high daily lens because the chances of this recurring again are a lot higher if you keep them back in that same lens. And then lid wiper epitheliopathy. So the lid wiper region, it's posterior to the line of marks and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just this set of cells that this is actually responsible for spreading the tears over the surface, kind of like a windshield wiper would spread windshield wiper fluid over the surface of your windshield. Now what happens in this, again, this is another friction related disorder. So if it's too dry and you have too much friction, that lid wiper will rub, rub, and rub, and it will become damaged, and then it will pick up stain when you put in fluorescein or lysamine. Again, it's basically just micro trauma with this. And it's much more common. You can get this in regular dry, but it's more common with soft uh, contact lens wear, especially lenses that are poorly weatherable, but it's less severe with sci-high lenses. So again, if you see this, it's good to switch a patient into a sci-high. And then we look at the cornea itself. So we know what this is for. It's for refracting light, providing that optical clarity and protection of the surface. 
So the first complication we can get with soft contact lenswear is staining. And staining is actually incredibly common in our contact lenswears. Over half of our contact lenswearers will develop staining, and this is both in hydrogels and uh, sci highs. That being said, it's less likely to occur with sci highs. So you kind of see this emerging pattern that typically these complications are less common with sci high wear. And you can kind of get an idea what's going on with the different patterns of staining. So that classic smile pattern is a one that we're probably going to see the most, and you can even see that in this image here. And the reason why you kind of get this smile like banding in the inferior aspect of the cornea is because this is where the tear film is the lowest. And if we have those patients who partial blink, this is where the tears don't get spread over it. So this area is more prone to drying out. The lens can tighten that area. You can get friction, which can lead to staining. And then, like I mentioned earlier, if you see staining in that limbal region, that can also be a sign that your contact lens has excess movement. That's why it's so important to always look not only at the, at when you're looking at the cornea, make sure that the lens has at least a millimeter of clearance beyond the limbal region. And when they blink, it's not rubbing over that because that excessive rubbing can lead to micro trauma and inflammation of that very, very sensitive limbal area. Now, hypoxia. As you can see here, now the, the words got really small on the slides because there's a bunch of different complications for that. Thankfully, nowadays, hypoxia is not a huge issue for most of us because we have these great modern lenses with really high DK values. So we're not really seeing quite as much of that hypoxia with daily wear. That being said, now most of our complications when it comes to hypoxia are from patients who abuse their lenses, patients who sleep in their lenses. Because even though we've gotten really good lens materials, even when you sleep in your lenses with the highest DK lens, you can still get complications from that. So when you have hypoxia, it's going to fundamentally change the ocular surface environment, and it's going to basically disrupt epithelial cell metabolism and homeostasis. And ultimately, this can lead to epithelial thinning. You can get premature loss of the endothelial cells even, and you also can get increased binding of bacteria to the surface, which are going to increase the chances of infection. Now, two specific conditions that can result from hypoxia are epithelial microcysts and also vacuoles. Again, these are more common. These are a bit more of a historical thing, but the epithelial microcysts, the kind of thing that was most notable about these is they have reverse illumination, whereas when you retroilluminate them, they appear dark. And it's more commonly associated with hydrogels, and it's actually thought to be due to degenerated basal epithelial cells. Whereas vacuoles is thought to be an accumulation of fluid between the cells, and they'll have the classic unreversed illumination, so they'll feel they'll appear bright. So the next thing we'll talk about is neovascularization. So this is probably, if any of us see a contact lens complication besides something like Claire, neovascularization is probably going to be one of the most common. Again, this is less common than it used to be. However, if we see it now, it's normally due to improper wear, a patient who's sleeping in their lenses, because this is going back to basically just hypoxia. So the cornea, again, is a vascular by necessity. But if it's not getting enough oxygen, the body, let's go back to homeostasis, the body wants to maintain this balance. It needs a proper amount of oxygen. And if it's not getting it, basically the body will start to grow these abnormal neovascular vessels onto the cornea to try to provide that oxygen. But again, we don't want the cornea vessels there because they can create scarring. And these neovascular vessels, they're abnormal. So this is just like diabetic retinopathy. We know that the vessels are more leaky. They're not going to basically function as well as we want in the retina. The same thing here is true for these vessels. You can start to get limp, you can start to get this lipid deposition as they leak out of the lenses, and all of these things can lead to scarring, and then you can have a loss of transparency. So the other thing I often mention, I like to kind of point out here, is I always think about the fact that daily disposable lenses, I'm a very big proponent of them. Oftentimes, if you have a patient who's sleeping in their lenses, ask them why. Many times it's a matter of convenience. And they're just like, well, my gosh, I'm tired at the end of the day. I mean, we've all been there where we're, we're, we're binge watching Netflix and we just pass out on the couch and now we're super tired and we're making the slog off the bed. And then you're like, oh, and then they'd be like, oh my gosh, I have to take my lenses out. I have to rinse them. I have to rub them. I have to put them in the case. So patients are like, you know what? I'm just going to sleep in the lenses. Whereas I always tell them, if you've got a daily disposable, you just rip that thing off. I don't care where it goes. It can go on the floor. You can deal with it in the morning, but it doesn't stay in your eye. So anytime I see these complications, I, I like to kind of get to the root of what's causing them to misuse their lenses. And then we have edema. So edema of the cornea is also exceedingly rare with our modern lens materials. 
And it's due to just increased anaerobic metabolism when, again, you have that hypoxia of the epithelial cells. And it's basically going to change the osmotic gradient, and you're going to get swelling. And when you get stromal edema, you can see the striae and the folds. And then you get the classic signs, which are kind of that glare, halo, or rainbows in the patient's vision. Uh, again, don't see it much here. You might see it some with overnight wear. And again, just less common with modern materials like silicone hydrogels. Now, this is a very interesting area to me where I, I did not really know this until I looked into this more. And it's what contact lenses, how they can actually affect the stroma. Because we often think of the epithelial layer, but this is seen in all contact lens wearers, whether it's a sci-high or a hydrogel, is that there is actually a thinning of the stroma. And this is thought, again, be, to be due to that fact that this is a foreign body on the surface, and it's eliciting this chronic microtrauma and inflammation. And what's thought to happen is you actually have a decreased density of the keratocytes, which are ultimately responsible for uh, stromal, basically, collagen production. And when you get their decrease in production, you actually get a thinner stroma. So just something to be aware of as well. Corneal warpage, pretty rare that you'll see it unless the patient's really miss, um, misusing their lenses now. And things you can see for that, you can get an irregular astigmatism or an increase in astigmatism, mostly more of a historical footnote at this point. But I have seen patients who they'll wear a daily lens for like a week or two straight or even longer, I hate to say, and you haven't taken off that. And the surface just, if you, if you look at it, it's just completely irregular and it takes time to kind of correct as well. So I've been alluding to this next slide a lot when I keep talking about the limbal region, because this is probably one of the most commonly missed complications of contact lens wear. And it's not super common, but you always want to be aware of that. So if you get an ill-fitting lens, or if the patient's abusing their lens, and you get this chronic trauma to that limbal region, you can get a loss of the limbal stem cells. And the limbal stem cells, as we all know, are going to replenish the surface. The, the surface of the cornea is replaced every three to 10 days, so it's highly mitotically active. But if you basically kill off these limbal stem cells, now you don't have that reservoir anymore. And what happens is you get conjunctivalization which is the conjunctival epithelium migrates onto the surface. What's the difference with the conjunctival epithelium? It has blood vessels in it. So again, you're going to risk of having that scarring. This image is actually of a patient I had with limbal stem cell deficiency. And it's going, basically going to disrupt all of your ocular surface homeostasis. Now you're going to have impaired wound healing because you can't move new epithelial cells into the cornea. You're also going to get this reduced epithelial cell turnover. And then the way you know you have this conjunctivalization, that you now have this migration of the conjunctiva onto the corneal surface is two things. One, it's going to carry those vessels over. You get this neovascularization, but you can also get something that's called late stain. And late stain is when you put fluorescein in on the eye and wait for it to wash out, give it about five minutes or so, and you will actually see the stain has seeped deep in between the epithelial cells because they don't have normal tight junctions on the conjunctival cells like you're going to see with the corneal ones, and it's going to lead to this late staining pattern. And I will also say this, I have seen patients who are completely compliant with contact lens wear develop limbal stem cell deficiency when they're in an older lens material. Typically what I hear is a patient is in a hydrogel lens and they've been wearing it for 20 years with no complication, but just because it has that lower decay, it has all those other issues, eventually they can develop this. So even if your patient's completely compliant, we need to be looking out for these potential complications. Then we're gonna talk about the nerves. The corneal nerves are probably one of my favorite things to talk about now, just because they impact ocular surface homeostasis to such an extraordinary extent. And we're really just now kind of figuring out exactly all it does. And this is my fun stat I always like to bring up is that the cornea is the most densely innervated structure in the body. It has 7,000 nerve endings per square millimeter. So it's sensing all kinds of things and it does all kinds of different mechanisms. So one, obviously it provides sensation and sensory feedback, but it's also involved in regulating our blinking and our tearing and also protecting the surface from that kind of that reflex of blinking as well. And it's involved in routine epithelial cell turnover, wound healing of the cornea and nourishment and metabolism for the epithelial cells. So if you have a damage to these corneal nerves, it's fundamentally going to disrupt ocular surface homeostasis. So this is a really big topic I'm going to talk about next because we've all talked about contact lens adaptation. So a patient's like, oh yeah, you'll, you'll get used to wearing the lens. It won't, if you feel a little bit of irritation now, it'll probably go away. 
And that's what we call adaptation, but it's really a reduced corneal sensitivity. Most of us are aware of the fact that our contact lens wearers will have a less sensitive ocular surface. However, you can get an increased sensitivity at the limbus, and that's because there's different pressure sensors to the nerves in that area, but you also get reduced palpebral conjunctival sensitivity, and the lid margin, which is the second most sensitive part of the ocular surface, will also be reduced. The other thing is you can get an upregulation of nerve growth factor in patients with contact lens discomfort. This is important because nerve growth factor is used to help basically heal and maintain the corneal nerves. So if you have this upregulation in NGF, this is a sign that there's nerve damage uh, occurring. And again, back to homeostasis, the body's trying to help rescue those nerves by increasing NGF production. So that can tell us in our patients who are experiencing contact lens discomfort, there's probably some nerve damage component to it. And on the extreme side of nerve damage, you can get neurotrophic keratitis. And that's where the nerves get damaged to the extent where they no longer provide sensory in, uh, feedback. And this is where you're going to get impaired blinking and lacrimation. You're gonna get reduced wound healing. And you're also gonna get disrupted epithelial cell turnover. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to lead to a breakdown of the ocular surface and you get these classic neurotrophic ulcers. Now, the flip side of this is neuropathic pain. Whereas with neurotrophic keratitis, you get this damage and you don't really feel it much because of a lack of sensation. With neuropathic pain, the nerves become hypersensitized. And that's where they start to get basically pain from even normal stimuli. The classic one is they go outside and there's a gentle breeze that normally a person couldn't even notice. They're going to be say, they're going to say that's really painful. They also might be hypersensitive to lights. They get that extreme photosensitivity or painful stimuli that is normally going to cause pain will be much more exaggerated. Now, when it comes to neuropathic pain, you actually, with contact lens wear, for some patients, they'll actually report an improvement with contact lens wear. For other patients will say, oh, it's a lot worse because my eyes are sensitive and you put a lens on the surface and it exacerbates that. So if you're looking at potentially treating neuropathic pain, you can always try a lens. Just let the patient know there's a chance it might help. There's a chance it might make it worse. Now, one of the things I've thought a lot about when I've really been thinking about the nerves in contact lens wear is the idea of adaptation. So the idea that our patients have decreased sensitivity, and if we kind of look at that idea of 51% of patients will drop out of contact lens wear, the more I thought about it, is it really possible that some of what we consider contact lens adaptation might actually be a mild form of neurotrophic keratitis, that the nerves are becoming less sensitive so they can tolerate this form body on the surface, whereas the patients who become contact lens intolerant they get the flip side of the coin and they become more neuropathic and they become hypersensitized. Again, nothing I've made, I've seen in the literature looking at this, but as I've tried to make sense of things, when again, we're just learning about the nerves, it would potentially make sense to me that that might be an element that's at play between our patients who are successful and those who are not. And then we're going to look at inflammation. I've mentioned this several times throughout the lecture that contact, soft contact lens wear can be intrinsically inflammatory. Uh, because again, putting an, you're putting this form body on the surface. And this has been shown when they look at dendritic cells. So when you're investigating for inflammation and you see the presence of dendritic cells, this is considered pathognomonic for an immune response for an inflammatory response. Now this inflammation is typically considered to be subclinical. So your patient might not even be aware that inflammation is occurring. So when you look at the conjunctiva and the lid margin, there is an increase in these dendritic cells and inflammation with soft contact lens wear. But thinking about this, does it make a lot of sense that you get inflammation of the conjunctiva when you really don't have that much overlap between the soft lens and that conj? It's actually thought that this is due to deposits on the contact lenses or bacteria or microbes in the contact lens case. So the idea here is that when you put it in the case and you put it on the eye, if it's not completely sterilized, you're going to get these microbes that elicit this immune re response. And this is backed up by the, basically the finding that this type of increase in inflammatory cell markers is transient at the bulbar conjunctiva and the lid margin. So it's more likely due to microbes than the lens itself. Whereas in the cornea, you can also get a transient increase in these dendritic cells, but it's also thought that this might be due to chronic microtrauma of the lens just rubbing over the corneal surface. And they've actually found that this inflammation is less pronounced with daily disposable Lens wear, which again might be due to the fact that we're not introducing these microbes from the lens case and things like that. Allergies. So allergies are a common thing. 40% of contact lens wearers will also experience allergies. And you know, with the allergies, you're gonna get that chronic itching, that mucus discharge. That's gonna be one of the biggest things for this. 
Um, so something to be aware of with our patients, if they're really struggling to wear contact lenses and they have allergies, just make sure that you're going to be addressing the allergy component because they're really gonna struggle to wear their lenses otherwise. And if they are an allergy patient, daily disposables are a great option because you're more likely to give up a belt of irritating allergens if you're using a re-wearable -lens, re lens. And this is another thing to be aware of if we're looking at packing solution and care solutions. So most of us are aware that when it comes to care solutions, multi-purpose ones, basically things that have PHMB or poly, uh, uh, polyquad, those are derived from BAK, and you can get preservative toxicity. All of us are very familiar with that. The classic is like in this picture here, you get this confluent SVK, just because you have this reaction to the multi-purpose solutions and the cleaners. What we think about less though, is that the packing solution itself that the contact lenses come in, they have potentially irritating substances. So they have borate and phosphate, and both of those can be cytotoxic to the corneal epithelium, but people often forget that. So my own personal experience with contact lenses is, I mentioned at the beginning, I started wearing contact lenses when I was 12, but like so many people, once I was into optometry school, and I was in my 20s, one day I woke up and I started experiencing just difficulty wearing my lenses that I never had before. One thing I found that was actually very helpful is I actually rinse my uh, lenses off after I take them out of the packing solution. And that helps quite a bit. So that's just something to be aware of that you can also get small amounts of exposure from just the packing solution itself. Contact lens discomfort. This is something a lot of people aren't aware of either, is that contact lens discomfort isn't a descriptor. This is actually a term for a specific condition. Contact lens discomfort is not due to dryness. Contact lens discomfort refers to specifically to discomfort caused by a contact lens itself. And it improves once the lens is off. This is a patient who's going to be like, oh, when I wear my glasses, I'm fine. I put the lens in the eye and then I'm going to be getting irritation. So this just means the lens typically isn't compatible with the person's eye. It's going to be influenced by the material, the design, their wear schedule. And it's likely thought that there's a nervous component to this as well. So now that we have all these complications, how can we manage our contact lens patients who are dealing with dry and ocular surface disease? So there's two things when it comes to managing these patients. And the first is contact lens selection and ocular surface optimization. And really you need both for our patients to successfully wear contact lenses. So first we're gonna take a look at contact lens selection. And the big thing about this is just going back to material properties. So DKT, this is oxygen permeability. For most of our modern lenses, this is not gonna be a huge issue. Most of them leave plenty of oxygen through. When we have modulus, modulus is the rigidity. It's how stiff the lens is. A lens with a lower modulus tends to be more comfortable on the eye where stiffer modulus can lead, be a little bit more irritating when a patient puts it on the eye. Lubricity, this is basically just how much friction is involved with wearing a lens. And I mentioned several different conditions that involve uh, friction related uh, discomfort and problems that you get with this. Wettability, to me, it's the same kind of idea when you're thinking of things like surface tension. And all that means, because surface tension to me was kind of this nebulous concept, it's really how easy can tears spread and adhere to the surface. So this is measured with wetting angle. If you remember that from class, I remember that vaguely, but basically what it is, if it has a lower wetting angle, that means that the tears will be able to spread more easily over the surface. It's a more wettable surface. And we always try to increase the um, wettability, the lubricity of our lens surfaces with surface treatments. So things like surfactants, plasma, and wetting agents, two of the most common are polyvinyl alcohol and hyaluronic acid, can be introduced to the lenses to just improve those properties. Now, the other thing with soft contact lens design, these ones we have a little bit less of a basically control over, but it's things like base curve. So these are just some of the basic things. So knowing if a lens is fitting too loose or too uh, tightly, you can alter the base curve. You can change the diameter. Again, making sure you have that good clearance over the limbus. You want to make sure there's some movement, but not too much movement. And then there's also lens edge design, which kind of helps with that interaction between the ocular surface and the lens itself. And then there's thickness of the lens depending on the prescription. So just things again to keep in mind when selecting a lens for a patient. And then we basically have the two types of contact lens polymers. This is probably the one where you have the most control here. And you've kind of heard me throughout the lecture discuss the difference between psi highs and traditional hydrogels. So the thing about hydrogels, it's one that we've all had before, is their big issue is they have a higher water content, which one is great because that tends to mean there's a lower modulus. They're considered a softer lens, so they can be more comfortable from that aspect, but they have that lower oxygen permeability. The other thing is you can get more discomfort. 
So there's almost kind of this paradoxical relationship. So, si so hydrogels have a higher water content, but they're actually more prone to actually causing dryness. And the reason for that is as you lose water content, as it evaporates from the lens, it actually can start to dry out and can actually pull moisture from the tear from an ocular surface, which can actually cause more dryness. And they were more prone to protein deposition and they're more hydrophilic. Now for sci highs, they're kind of the opposite. They have great oxygen permeability, but they're intrinsic, intrinsically hydrophobic. So they're not really great with wetting. They're also going to have that stiffer modulus. So the early sci highs, there were some comfort issues. However, because we have these new surface treatments, we've been able to really improve the weatherability of the lenses. And now they're pretty much on par with hydrogels. And then there's wear schedules. So these ones are pretty obvious, the difference between the two of these. So daily disposables, the great thing about these is they've actually been shown that you can get lens deposits, but they're negligible because the buildup doesn't really build up to the point where you're going to have any significant, basically noticing of it because you toss it at the end of the day. Whereas with our monthly and bi-weeklies, we're more prone to these deposits and the lens material can degrade over time. So some patients I know, a lot of them are even in the monthly, they can't get to two weeks. And that's where you can also get this variable comfort with wear duration with their replacement lenses. Whereas the daily disposables, they tend to stay very comfortable. You get a new lens every day. And one of the big ones for me is again, it doesn't require a care solution. This is huge because there was a study that came out and they actually showed that 99% of contact lens wearers, so almost every single one had at least one hygiene risk behavior. So for me, if I can avoid the need for them to depend on a patient to actually be using a care solution, that's a big win and one less thing to worry about by just getting them a fresh lens every day. Now, this is more of a previous issue because things are getting better. A lot of times based on parameters, what a patient needed for if they have a high script or you're looking for different specialty types of lenses within that, you might be somewhat limited in a daily disposable as far as parameters. So most of our reusable lenses do have wider parameters, but that gap is starting to close. And the nice thing about the daily disposables I mentioned earlier, convenience. It's easy to get a fresh lens, toss them, they're easy to travel with. You just take a strip of lenses instead of taking a care solution. However, again, this is changing too. They do tend to be more expensive versus a reusable lens. So there is that factored into it. And then there's also compliance issues with the replaceable lenses. But then on the daily disposable side, I, I've encountered, I'm sure we always have, patients who have the environmental concerns. They feel bad about constantly, you know, having to throw away a lens every day. Thankfully, most of the contact lens manufacturers now have recycling programs for the lens cases and the lenses themselves, just so we can lessen that environmental impact of daily disposables. And then if you do have a patient who does need to use a reusable lens, we're looking at care solution selection. So personally, I'm a very big proponent of hydrogen peroxide for a few reasons. One is it's one step. You don't have to rinse, you don't have to rub. And that's the thing with most multipurpose solutions, it's a two-step process. And they've shown in study after study that most patients do not do two steps. You're likely, you're, half the time we're lucky if we remind them to always not top off solution. So every time you add an extra step, there's an extra risk and basically imparted onto this that the patient might not do that one step. The other thing is with hydrogen peroxide, it's preservative free. So you don't have to worry about having any of those antimicrobial agents in the multi-purpose solutions that can be irritating to the ocular surface. And they have shown in studies too that hydrogen peroxide does provide better contact lens comfort. And you also do get better protection against things like acanth amoeba, which is another major factor that I would say just, I always tell my patients who are in a reusable lens, I would, I would say if you really wanna get the best cleaning and the best comfort, hydrogen peroxide is the way to go. However, sometimes if a patient has to take the lens out and put them in, before they have that six to eight hours for the hydrogen peroxide to fully take effect, it's not a bad idea for them to have a bottle of multi-purpose solution on hand in that case, if they need just more of a quick rinse and rub in that situation. So then as far as lens selection, the big takeaways for this is, I will say a daily disposable lens whenever possible. sci highs tend to provide better comfort, less complications. And if you do need to be using a care solution for a reusable solution, hydrogen peroxide is probably the, gonna be the care uh, system of choice. And then for this next section, I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through this. This is more because this is its own entire lecture here. And this is going to be how we manage the ocular surface conditions that our dry patients may be, uh, be facing when they're wearing contact lenses. And this kind of goes back to that same thing I talked about at the beginning. We start at the lid and lash complications if they have that bacterial or that demodex blepharitis. 
Hygiene and things like Xdembi are great. So hypochlorous acid is really good if you're going to be treating bacterial blepharitis. If a patient has Demodex blepharitis, Xdembi is great. It's able to really eradicate the mites at the fundamental level. And then things like tea tree oil and okra based cleansers can be used for maintenance hygiene. That's typically what I want to do. And if they do have really heavy lid uh, margin debris, that can be that buildup of biofilms and debris. That's where manual and office debridement with things like a new lids pro, zest, blood effects, that can be used to just very quickly eliminate that irritating debris. And IPL can be really great for addressing issues with the lids and lashes as well. Then there's just your basic treatments for the myobomy glands and the lipid layer. I'm a big fan of omega-3 fatty acid uh, supplementation. There's blink exercises. There's now things like perfluorohexyl octane, which can help stabilize the ocular, uh, stabilize the tear film. One thing with that, you do have to let your contact lens wearers know that they should take their contact lenses out if they're going to be using Mybo. And then you also have our classic standbys, things like warm compresses and massage and preservative free artificial tears. Then you can also do expression procedures, thermal pulsation, gland expression with our standbys like Lipoflow, Ilex Tear Care. You can also use radio frequency. That's what I've been implementing now, which works really, really well. And again, you can improve basically the ocular surface. You can improve the meibomian gland structure and function with IPL treatments. Then we have our classic anti-inflammatories. You have your steroids, which you can use at a pulse if you really need to try to bring down inflammation quickly. For long-term inflammation management, we have immunomodulators, your cyclosporins, your lefithograst. And now we also have some new class of medications that can help as well. Things like neurostimulators like Tiravaya, which can increase tear production. Um, and also the ITR100 device can do a similar thing through external stimulation. And then it's always good to tell our patients to know what artificial tear that is compatible with their contact lenses. And then we have the regenerative treatments. If we have patients who have more of that kind of nerve damage or really disrupted ocular surface, they can use uh, platelet-rich plasma. That's what I've been using quite a bit now, autologous serum, amniotic membranes. And then there's allergies. I mentioned that earlier. So there's a lot of good allergy treatments. So olipatidine is great. You can use it once a day. That can kind of, that's that classic mast cell, um, mast cell stabilizer antihistamine. There's also some newer options. Now we have things like Ectoin, which is an Optase Allegro. The reason why I like that is it kind of creates a barrier. So it works through, Ectoin works through something called preferential exclusion, where this Ectoin molecule, it pulls water molecules in tight and it basically makes a hydration or a water shield. So when a person puts this on the ocular surface, it's gonna bring in the molecules tight. So if environmental irritants and allergens hit the ocular surface, they're not able to penetrate through and get to the surface and elicit that type of irritation or that allergic response. And we even now have catodifin eluding contact lenses that will elude that uh, antihistamine while the patient's wearing them. And then some other regenerative treatments, we have Synagramin, which is Oxervate, which can help with neurotrophic keratitis. The other ones I had mentioned before, like platelet-rich plasma and amniotic membranes. And there's even surgical options when you get into the extremes of nerve damage. And IPL, one thing I want to mention here, because I've mentioned this several times throughout this, I really like this as just a general ocular surface treatment because it's going to be able to address several of the contributory factors to dry eye and a single treatment modality. It's going to improve MGD. It's going to improve inflammation. It's going to really help with ocular rosacea because it destroys those pro-inflammatory telangiectatic vessels around the eyes, it can decrease the microbial lid um, burden on the lid, and it has been shown specifically to help with contact lens associated dry eye. So the last little section I want to talk about here is just some general clinical pearls and a sign of things to come. In my experience, contact lens heart intolerance is normally the first sign a patient is developing dry eye. If you talk to many of your dry eye patients, they'll often say, or they come into you because they can no longer wear your contact lenses. So that can be sign number one that you should be looking for dry eye. The other thing is do not under overestimate adaptation. I always say if a patient puts on a lens and if it's irritating within the first minute, it's normally only going to get worse. I feel like that's almost become a myth that's become propagated within um, eye care that a patient will adapt to a lens. It's likely not going to happen. So I will say if right there, just headed off of the pass. If they put it on, they're like, yeah, it's it's irritating. And ask the patient, because they'll try to placate us. They, they never want to say things are bad. Typically, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's okay. They say it's okay. It means it's probably irritating. So automatically try to find a different lens in that um, scenario. Also, if your patient has dry eye, discuss expectations. I always tell them, yeah, I really want you to be able to wear lenses. You might not get a full day. 
you might be able to get a few hours. And if you do want to get a few hours, try to save that from when they're most needed. So if they really want to wear their lenses working out, they should use those few hours when they're working out versus just wearing it throughout the day. The other things I'm going to say here are a little bit counter to kind of conventional wisdom with contact lenses now. And one is if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If a patient is happy with their current lens and it's not creating any health issues to the surface, I won't change their lens. And the reason for this is sometimes we get in the mentality of, oh, we should just switch to a new lens because we have this great new lens. And even though these lenses are great, oftentimes the patients is going to be like, well, why did I change? My lens worked well, fine. So patient satisfaction, again, if they are comfortable and it's not causing any irritation and it looks healthy, I always leave them in their current lens because that means it's doing well with their ocular surface. The other thing is spherical equivalent. Contact lens patients tend to be, you know, with dry tend to be very, very sensitive. And, you know, our toric lenses are great, but they do have a bit more of that balance, balancing. Sometimes they're a bit thicker by necessity to keep the lens in its proper orientation. And patients are a bit more sensitive to this. So oftentimes, if a patient is at one diopter or less, I will use the spherical equivalent. I have this discussion with them that, you know, your vision might not be as sharp as it could be, but you're going to be able to wear the lens. And that's what some people might give me pushback. And they're like, well, yeah, but they're not going to see as sharply as they can. My counter to that would be like, you're, that's true, but they're not going to be able to wear the lens at all. So no, most patients would give a little bit of a trade-off for a little bit of clarity to be able to wear their lenses. So just a philosophy I have, especially with dealing with dry patients and contact lens wear. And find a good artificial tear, like I mentioned before. And when I mean red means stop, that means if a patient is experiencing redness, even if they don't have any discomfort, like I mentioned earlier, that normally is there's a sign that something is going on, even if it's subclinical inflammation. So if your eye, patient's getting really a high amount of redness, again, you should be rethinking that lens. Rinsing out the lenses after taking them out of the blister pack, I mentioned that earlier, that's a good thing for patients who are really, uh, really going to be you know, sensitive to any type of preservatives. And part-time wearers, I always tell my patients, they're like, well, I don't wear lenses too much. So I mean, do I really need a daily? I say it's actually perfect for them because then they only get what they need. They can wear the lens and toss it instead of having the lens just sit in a case. So I just let them know that even though it might seem contrary to what they're thinking, they're actually the best potential wearers for daily disposable. And along those same lines, if you're in doubt if the patient can, you know, should go with a daily or they should go with that, give them the daily. It's more hygienic, tends to provide more comfort. And when it comes to complications, I take a strike one, you're out philosophy, which once they're starting to develop GPC or anything like that, I don't put them back in the same lens. I put them in a new lens just because the chances of recurrence are really high. And the big thing is at the end of the day, lens selection and all the ocular surface treatments are needed. You really need to do both, not one, just the other to effectively manage our dry eye contact lens patients. And also try on the lenses if you have a chance, get to know them yourself so you can have a personal experience with the lenses. And just to summarize all the information here, I know we covered a bunch. Biggest things are soft contact lenses are amazing, but they do present this homeostatic challenge. They do disrupt the ocular surface. So it's our job to get the right lens selection, look what's going on with the patient's ocular surface, and make sure we address any concomitant ocular surface disease by finding the lens that's gonna best work with their natural microbiome and their ocular surface.